Yes. All right. We are live in five, four, three, two, one. Namaste and warm welcome to the 40th webinar of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. The today's topic is very unique and very distinctive. We are going to have discussion, particularly lecture, followed by that a discussion on a very unique topic of improving patient's satisfaction by empathy training. We try to satisfy our patients by our surgery, by our diagnosis, by our recent techniques. But today we are going to discuss completely a new way of improving patient's satisfaction. We are really fortunate to have an authority on the subject, Dr. Helen Race, who is a psychiatrist at Harvard Medical School. And he's an authority on the subject of empathy. She's going to give her experience and knowledge about this. Actually, she founded the company, which is Empathetics Incorporation, to carry out a research and a training sessions on this subject. She has also written a book, The Empathy Effect, which has been translated into four languages. And even audio book is also available. So I have read this book and I strongly suggest that every doctor should read it because definitely that gives an insight to improve our communication with our patient. Her TED talk, which has been seen yesterday, I checked the count. It has been uh, viewed by 623,000 people. So that shows the interest world over on the subject. We are again very fortunate to have uh, another expert on the subject of empathy and compassion. We have with us Professor Michael Goldberg, who is a retired professor and chairman of orthopedics at Tufts University. After retirement, he is now attached with the Swartz Center of Compensate Care. And that is a center which is trying to work to develop a healthy relation between patients and physicians. He was a past president of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America. When he was active in practice, he has contributed on skeletal dysplasia and outcome measures. What we are doing is exactly what our patients are expecting from us. And he has uh, like found out few new conditions and they are named, those, those skeletal dysplasia are named after him also. Now he's focusing on the well-being of physicians and their team and how to prevent burnout. He was with us before six months on a webinar where we discussed how to prevent burnout of doctors. We have another giant with us and actually, POSI members don't need the introduction. That's Professor Asok Jori. But there are many surgeons, physicians who are watching this program. And for their benefit, I will give a small introduction about uh, Professor Asok Jori. Professor Asok Jori, Jori is a co-founder of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. In 1994, along with Professor Benjamin Joseph, Professor K. Siram, Professor Valgis Chako, the POSI was founded. And after 25 years, we have reached this level. And we are really fortunate that we are standing on the shoulder of giants. He was a past president of POSI. He's a current president of CICOT. From 2020 to 2022, he's a president of CICOT. Is editor in chief of Journal of Pediatric Orthopedic B from 2006 to date. He was a past president of Indian Orthopedic Association, Indian Academy of Cerebral Palsy, Asia Pacific Pediatric Orthopedic Society, Asia Pacific Knee Society. So we are really fortunate, and the best part is he is really interested for how to use empathy in our practice. So both Professor Goldberg and Professor Jory, they are going to 
work as a moderator after the lecture is over. Just as a few lines about the format of webinar, we will have a 40 minutes lecture first by Dr. Helen Reis. After that, we will have our questions. If you have any questions, you can WhatsApp your questions to this number, I repeat, 98230-63989. 98230-63989. Before I hand over to uh, Helen, I just would like to remind you that if you miss this webinar, or if you really want to view this webinar again, the link on which you are viewing this webinar will be also allowing you to see this. And this webinar will be posted on the POSI's website after a few days. So either you can use the same link or you can see on the POSI website. Just a last sentence about the upcoming webinar. On the 22nd June, we have a webinar on the slip capital femoral epiphysis. And we have again a galaxy of speaker with us. So with that, once again, I thank Dr. Helen Reyes for accepting our invitation. And with this sincere gratitude, I now stop sharing the screen and I hand over to Helen Reyes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Gungwala. I really appreciate that very kind introduction. It's an honor to be presenting today along with Dr. Goldberg, Dr. Johari, and with you. So um, without further ado, I will share my screen and begin uh, this presentation. So good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure and an honor to share the many years of research that my empathy program team members at Mass General Hospital have done that have resulted in the training um, that I'm going to be sharing the research uh, process a little bit and also uh, the ways that em empathy relates to physician wellness and patient care. Um, as Dr. Gendwala has said, I am the founder and Chief Scientific Officer and CEO of Empathetics. It's an organization that now um, delivers the empathy training that you'll hear about in an online format for broad dissemination in healthcare systems. I'd like to begin with one of my favorite quotes, which is from Immanuel Kant, which is, compassion is one of the impulses that nature has implanted in us to do what duty alone may not accomplish. Many people in healthcare today, especially with the stresses of the pandemic, are, are doing their duties. And um, it, it's a very important reminder how important compassion and empathy are at a time when the world has seen unprecedented suffering and sickness. The impact of the coronavirus, I understand, is still very significant in India. It continues to plague our country as well. And we have moved from a healthcare system that once looked more like this, where doctors and patients could be close together, could be sharing eye contact and understanding one another's emotions, to a time when the way we convey that we're here for our patients looks more like this, with physical signs, the importance of eye contact, but how difficult it is to be treated by healthcare professionals who have most of their bodies covered up um, in an effort to protect themselves so they can continue to work with patients and not become ill themselves. So we're going to talk about empathy and its benefits to healthcare. We're going to touch on what is empathy and how is it different from compassion. We'll talk about how it affects the patient experience very profoundly, how burnout is um, a challenge and how empathic care actually contributes to condition, condition wellness and job satisfaction. And finally, some words about how 
empathy and compassion actually help hard health outcomes. It is not just about providing a better patient experience, but it also contributes to better health care. So some years ago, I did a webinar at the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Care, which is the center that Dr. Goldberg is associated with and the one that Dr. Ganjwala referred to. Um, and we asked about 500 uh, physicians and hospital administrators at the present time, did you believe that empathic care was on the rise, declining or about the same? And you'll see that about half believed that empathic care was declining. And sadly to say, the statistics have not gotten better since that survey. And when asked how many believe that their institutions or clinics could benefit from empathy training, 90% of the respondents said yes. And then when we asked on this poll, um, how, what, what were people contributing, uh, attributing these barriers to empathy? We found that um, only 4% believed that patients were more demanding. 21% uh, said it had to do with burnout, 18% to greater computer use, but almost 60% believed it had to do with lack of time. And one of the myths that I'd like to dispel today in our discussion is that empathy takes Showing empathy and compassion actually saves time because we tune in to the greatest concerns that our patients have instead of wasting time avoiding what they want to speak about. The big question has always been, is empathy something can, that can be taught or is empathy just an inborn trait? This question was what led me to pursue um, an empathy, neuroscience of empathy fellowship at Harvard Medical School, where I got to take a deep dive into the neuroscience of empathy because my question was, could we do something about this trend? So before we go further, I'd like to just share some definitions because it's sometimes confusing. What is the difference between sympathy, empathy, and compassion? Sympathy is an ancient term that was uh, brought into the lexicon when people noticed that we share emotions with one another. We actually, uh, feel suffering when we see someone suffering. And it has come to mean feeling sorry for people or even taking pity on them. Empathy is a much newer term, um, about 100 years old, and it is from the Greek meaning in someone's suffering. And it means that we are understanding the thoughts and really feeling with others, not just feeling for. And neuroscience shows that when we resonate and feel with others pain that motivates empathic concern and empathic behaviors just to contrast antipathy has similar roots which means against or avoiding another person's suffering and it's difficult to be in between showing that we care or showing that we don't so we have to be careful that we are not conveying antipathy when we are detached and not really tuned in to patients' uh, concerns. And finally, compassion is the Latin word that means co with someone suffering. And it really is the response that we see. When we say someone is compassionate, it's because we have noticed something that they are doing, a tone of voice, a look, a behavior. So empathy is the input to help us appreciate what other people are feeling and thinking and compassion is the outpouring it's the it's the good heartedness that comes out of us when we want to respond to others so we will talk first about empathy and the patient experience because after all the patient experience is what they leave our care with and it's what is to them they may assume that they're going to get excellent medical care, but how they're treated is what, what they go home with. So there are four basic components to empathy. Empathy is not just all about feeling, it's about cognitively understanding what people are going through and 
being curious about their perspective and how they see the world. It is, uh, it comes from that saying, walking in someone else's shoes and looking through their eyes. The affective or emotional component of empathy is that emotional resonance that we feel when we see someone sad and we have mirror neurons in our brains that actually pick up those feelings and trigger the same feelings within ourselves. Another component of empathy is that behavioral component that's motivated by perceiving others pain and suffering and that is behavioral empathy which we also call compassion and there is a moral component an overlap that when we see people who are suffering or sad that we are moved to do something and sometimes just perceiving it is not enough to get us to do something but our moral inclinations often get us past the feeling of that not having enough time or energy and doing the right thing. I will refer you to my article in the Journal of the American Medical Association called Empathy in Medicine, a Neurobiological Perspective to share some of the details about how empathy and the brain works. So one of the biggest challenges to empathy is when physicians and nurses become emotionally aroused due to perceived threats or real threats that patients are, uh, are directing toward us. This can be a criticism, it can be uh, disappointment in an outcome, it can be um, a lack of understanding uh, what their expectations were about care, and then they may become very angry and, and even somewhat attacking. And when these behaviors uh, are directed at healthcare professionals, just like any other human being, we get emotionally aroused. And um, unless we're being physically threatened, um, it's really important from, from our professional role to remain curious about why the person is so upset rather than getting automatically triggered to become upset ourselves. The reason this happens, of course, is that when we perceive a threat, the amygdala signals the brainstem to have this autonomic nervous system reaction. And um, our heart rate, our our uh, perspiration, our blood pressure, our respiration rate, all these uh, reactions happen extremely quickly. And also the cranial nerves, which are have their nuclei in the brainstem for tone of voice and facial muscle expression are, um, are also triggered um, really in about 50 milliseconds. And so it's this emotional arousal that often interferes with empathy because when we feel emotionally aroused, we direct our attention at ourselves. And this screenshot will show you how when we measure physiologic responses between patients and physicians, we could see exactly how emotionally activated patients became when doctors said things like, I don't really have time for all of this, or I thought I went over this last time. And the patient's tracing here in pink gets very um, charged up and becomes angry, um, whereas better communication skills might have managed the patient's questions and um, concerns in a much more uh, compassionate way. And our research shows that patient and physician physiology actually matches up like a mirror when patients feel understood. So one of the first steps to becoming more empathic and compassionate is through self-awareness. And um, I, I can assure you that I've used this photograph of the Taj Mahal um, for years, well before this webinar, but I love it because the only reason we can see the details of this beautiful, uh, this beautiful monument is that the water is still and calm. And I use this picture to show that when we too can remain still and calm and open our perception to the details in our patients' faces and postures and voices that we become automatically more tuned in. 
We also really train on self-awareness and mindfulness and self-regulation skills in order to find quick ways to remain calm and to get centered so that we have a professional and a caring presence. Um, the studies I did in my fellowship led to creation of this empathy acronym, which is now um, a trademarked uh, way to remember how we really connect. And it's the subject of, of my book. Um, and we connect with others through eye contact, through noticing their muscles of facial expression, to interpreting what their posture and position means and what our posture and position conveys, such as standing over people with a dominant position, naming their affect, understanding their tone of voice, hearing the whole person, and recognizing what our reaction is quite quickly, realizing that many times we are reacting because the person is suffering. And when they're suffering, they might be critical of us, they might be yelling at us, they might be um, threatening all kinds of things. But as long as our physical safety is ensured, our reaction is really a mirror of what they are going through. And our response would be to try to calm this person down and not to fight back so that we can get to a level understanding of what they are so worried about or so upset about. So you may ask, how do we know that empathy training works? Well, after I um, developed some training interventions based on the neuroscience of empathy, I put together a brief training intervention and then I looked for volunteer departments at Mass General Hospital to engage their physicians in training in the empathy training. And six departments participated. They were medicine, surgery, orthopedic surgery, psychiatry, uh, ophthalmology, and anesthesia. And we wanted to see if a brief training intervention on emotional communication, perspective taking, and self-management skills would actually result in higher patient ratings of physician empathy. And please note that we were not asking for self-report because we do not believe that physician self-ratings are um, very accurate, but we concerned with whether patients could see a difference in our randomized control trial. So some quick results. We found that our training group, um, and just to be clear, we had a cohort of 100 physicians. A computer randomized them to the training or control group. Uh, patients rated the physicians before any training took place um, and were not aware of a training that was coming up. And then we had um, about 10 patients per doctor rate them after the training took place so that this was truly a randomized control trial. Their improvement in knowledge of the neurobiology um, was obviously much higher in the training group. Uh, we were very surprised and happy to see that our training resulted in much better facial expression decoding of patient emotions. Um, and you can see that our major outcome measure, uh, the care measure, showed that almost twice as many physicians received significantly higher empathy rating scores in the training group compared to the control group. And these are the items of our main outcome measure. You can read them yourself, um, but they comport to some of the most important ratings of physicians um, in, in, in our country on rating um, hospitals, which is, are they really listened to? Are things explained clearly? And are they shown care and compassion? Our program evaluation received evaluations of 94% and above about whether this training was interesting, helpful, and whether they could apply the concepts directly to their clinical practice. And we did a one-year follow-up study with our original cohort at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, 
because they were still all together a year later. And you can see that their care measure scores were virtually identical up uh, one year after the training. Um, and then we asked the participants to self-evaluate in our randomized controlled trial about whether they learned not to interrupt, whether they were better at reading emotional cues, whether they could manage their own physiologic reactions and become more skilled at um, managing the patient's physiologic reactions and so that they had a greater um, ability to, to manage the relationships in a positive way. Um, the New York Times picked up on this study because it was one of the first to show that, um, actually it was the first to show that doctors could learn empathy. And this, um, this uh, misconception that empathy was something that could not be taught was really debunked um, in our study. And it was considered a groundbreaking uh, research to really shift the thinking about empathy being something that can be uh, taught and learned and that it could help physicians improve their understanding of patients and help patients feel more cared for and feel that they had been treated with compassion. Um, just to share quickly, um, this was, this training was uh, recently used in the field, not in a, uh, you know, a scientifically designed uh, randomized control trial, but at Sutter Health in California, they embarked on a journey with empathetics, the program to see if it could improve um, the provider communication at their hospital. And they had a pilot cohort of nine departments, a completion rate of 86%. They used pre-post observations and they had Sutter um, coaches trained by empathetics and used the empathetics training, um, the online training. They also had the trained coaches offer supplemental coaching to their clinicians. And they were very happy with their results that the, um, that the uh, clinician group scores that are used uh, nationally in, in the United States for the empathy cohort um, improved significantly. Um, they had the uh, OB department called out separately because they also got the, um, the in-person live training. Um, and this was the untrained group here at the end. And you will see here that the group in the middle here in orange is the OB group that received both the online training plus the uh, empathetics workshop and some coaching. And they achieved a 90.4% patient satisfaction rating. Now, we are in a period of time when almost no one can talk about healthcare without talking about the burnout epidemic. And um, burnout has been a problem in medicine well before the pandemic. And this quote um, by Dr. Shapiro says, we believe one unintended and unfortunate side effect of medical training is that it produces physicians who believe that self-denial is valuable and necessary and that living under stress is normal. Well, these beliefs got put to the ultimate test and are continuing to be put to the ultimate test because of the extraordinary burdens and time and uh, dedication that's being required from healthcare physicians. Um, and obviously, it is not a sustainable profession if we believe that self-denial and living under stress is, a, is, um, is normal. So what we are trying to suggest and recommend is that even during um, the challenges of a pandemic, that an emphasis on relationships and resources on 
keeping open dialogue and having uh, opportunities for people to to vent and discuss and to share what they're going through and to try to make meaning out of what is happening. Um, these things can start uh, with really contacting healthcare workers, checking in with them, because without constant dialogue and emphasis on the relationships, we can end up with despair, with isolation, depression, and even suicidal thoughts and actions. Uh, recent studies show that up to 42 to 58 percent of physicians are showing signs of burnout. And um, these numbers are just rising, and they're also very significant in nurses. When stress rises, empathy suffers, and it's often because people feel too exhausted and too um, to focused on their own suffering. Um, and empathy starts to wane for the patient and also for oneself. So this article is very interesting because it shows how empathy is a protective factor of burnout in physicians. And it shows how new neurophenomenological hypotheses regarding empathy and sympathy in the care relationship can actually bolster a sense of well-being. And I refer you to this, this excellent article. Um, burnout creates institutional risks because there are increased communication failures and tendency to take shortcuts. There are more errors and increased tendency to cover up rather than to disclose an increased dissonance between patients and providers. And um, at least in the United States, um, we see an increase in malpractice claims. So how does empathy actually improve clinician meaning and work and, and become a, a protective factor? Uh, we know that one of the reasons that people are drawn to healthcare professions is that the act of helping others is intrinsically rewarding. And um, it is actually the reason that the human species is in existence. It's because of the tendency toward collaboration, cooperation, and helpfulness, which was central to our existence um, from tribal times to the current day. And when we open our channels to look for meaning in work, to look for those moments when we make a difference, and they can be micro moments, and we also develop ways to give back to ourselves in the smallest ways, we realize that empathy is very empowering. And um, even in the midst of a horrible pandemic, there are things that we can be grateful for. You know, we can look for things that, um, you know, improve. For example, when there wasn't enough protective equipment to go around where hospital workers were terrified of contracting the virus. Um, once that threat was managed by getting the proper protective equipment, it took the stress and burden of being that worried about getting sick um, off the table. And so it, a reminder of things that, that are getting better as they are getting better and not only focusing on what is difficult and worse. And in this, in these pictures, you know, um, we can see that even with a gloved hand and a masked face, we can still offer the human touch. We can still be um, present in ways um, even if in a masked face, so much of empathy is conveyed through the eyes. So I would like to also mention the importance of something that sounds a little strange, which is self-empathy. Self-empathy is not the same as selfishness. Self-empathy is the recognition that you cannot pour water from an empty pitcher. 
once the water is out of the pitcher, it has to be refilled if we're going to fill someone else's glass. And so we have to look at ways that will support our own well being so that we have the energy and stamina to face and help with compassion the people who are coming to us frightened, worried, sick, and um, at sometimes the point of death. So we need to address and think of ways that we can keep our mental well-being uh, front and foremost, that we attend to our physical needs through physical exercise, um, whether it be um, you know yoga poses or doing something for cardiac um, health, but neglecting our mental and physical uh, needs will lead to burnout. And understanding the importance of community cohesion, having leaders reach out to their workers, even if it's a quick phone call or an email to say, I'm thinking of you, how are you doing? So that people know they still belong to a community and that they know that their presence matters. Uh, to their leaders and to their organization. And finally, finding meaning in adversity is one of the keys to resilience. If we only look at all the things going wrong and the things that fill us with despair, we miss uh, many lessons that we learn about how we come together to face a crisis that the world can all relate to. I have just two slides about the importance of empathy and healthcare outcomes. My research group at Massachusetts General Hospital was frequently asked if improving the patient experience also had an impact on hard health outcomes. We uh, got a grant from the Gold Foundation and did a three-year study looking at every randomized control trial that claimed that patient clinician relationship factors um, actually had the greatest result on a healthcare outcome. We did a systematic review and a meta-analysis of all randomized control trials. And I refer you to this 2014 PLOS One article for all the details, but I will show you that um, we found 13 very rigorously done studies that showed that just by showing empathy, using motivational interviewing and patient-centered care, um, that you know, one of the greatest health challenges in the world is obesity, and that the p-value was zero, which means that the way the patient was treated in a, in a weight loss program by his or her providers was a direct causation of their ability to lose weight. We had also, beautiful p-values on studies of osteoarthritis where communication, empathy, and group discussions um, and pain evaluation were done um, to augment the uh, medical treatment. Um, lung infections also improved communication, empathy, and to share decision making, and asthma. Um, so since we are facing so many lung infections today, we can really appreciate these well done studies to show how much communication um, made a difference. Um, we've already talked about my book, which I refer to you because it discusses the power of empathy, not just in medicine, but also in leadership, in business, in parenting, and in everyday life. Um, there's a chapter on each of these topics and um, and as, as we already you know, heard from Dr. Gan, Ganjwala that my TED talk will also give you a deeper dive into some of these topics. It's, a, it's about a 17 minute TED talk. So how do we put this all together to heal the emotion gap in medicine? First, we need a leadership commitment um, to, a, understanding how important these interpersonal factors are in healthcare. 
We need structural changes to make the delivery of health care as smooth and as problem free as possible. Implementing training, whether it be empathy training, communication skills training, um, is very necessary so that everyone is on the um, so I was saying that implementing training to um, to bring all members of the healthcare team up to the same level of skills and expectations um, also brings people together in a learning community, which also helps to um, mitigate against burnout. And building community is essential, bringing people together. Um, this is a pre-COVID <laughs> photograph, but um, we can come together wearing masks and still build community. And finally, tapping into our hearts and what brought us to healthcare professions and wanted us, made us want to help people. Um, when we lose that, that's when we really get burned out. And so tapping back into the joy of medicine, the joy of helping and being part of the solution and not part of the problem is probably one of the most rewarding opportunities we have as healthcare professionals today. And my last slide is a beautiful quote um, that says, your vocation lies in the place where your deep gladness meets the world's deep need. And our world has rarely been in such deep need um, as we've all faced this past year. And we hope that this presentation will help invigorate and enliven people to do the work, the extraordinary work that lies before them. So thank you so much for your attention. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Helen, for a wonderful exposition on the subject. To begin uh, some questions uh, session, I would like to ask one question that in the COVID time, we strongly suggested avoid physical consultation and try to go for teleconsultation. Now, how do you see teleconsultations vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, physical consultation? Because uh, I found that teleconsultation, you cannot develop a rapport with patient, which you can develop uh, uh, in the physical consultation. So what are your suggestions for improving the teleconsultation? Well, that's an excellent question. And as a practicing psychiatrist, I too have been using strictly telemedicine. And uh, my experience is that in some ways with the patient's face right in front of us, the face is a roadmap of emotion. And you're right, we don't get the entire body language to you know, relate as a full person, but in some ways we are seeing even more and it also helps people take their masks off so that we can um, appreciate what their facial expressions are telling us. I think that, you know, we can look in the camera as opposed to looking at the person and remember that that kind of eye contact really does help. And so we do train people to remember to toggle up and look at the camera. So when you ask a question like, how are you doing today? that that is what much different than looking down on our screen. Um, and it's, it's, it's a toggling, but I think people, when they see that we are really concerned and interested in how they are doing, and we don't jump right into a review of systems or asking how their chest pain is or how their, their knee is healing, but um, you know, that we, we attend to how they're doing you know, just as a human being and how are, how are you and your family doing in this COVID time? Like, is anyone sick? Like where we realize there's a huge perspective going on um, in most people's lives with this pandemic. Thank you. Now I uh, ask uh, Professor Goldberg and Professor Jory to ask questions. Michael, you, you want me to begin? Okay. No, so um, again, I uh, greatly enjoyed uh, listening to you. This isn't the first time, and each time I, uh, I learn more. Uh, the, 
the uh, I think that um, Jeremy brings up a very important question about uh, telemedicine, and uh, uh, it, yes, in this closeness that we have face to face, but uh, there is still uh, some the touch, the body posture, the um, uh, that is so intrinsic in a physical examination while we're doing it, that touch nourishes me as well as the, the patient. And I, um, I'm still concerned about uh, what the future might bring if we have more and more telemedicine. Are you rethinking about how you're going to do this training. Not that it's virtual training, but even the instructions for what we should do as providers and practitioners. And uh, how do we, uh, uh, I, I will say that one of my patients commented that um, they love telemedicine because I wasn't looking at the computer that I actually was more compassionate this way. So that's an important point you raised. But the whole uh, act of physical examination and care is what fills my picture. And so how do we have self-empathy and continue as you look ahead and what medicine is going to uh, change? You know, Michael, you raise such a profound question about how much of our coming together with patients is, is still going to be like in the flesh where people have to get in a car or somehow on a subway or somehow get to our offices and see us in the flesh. And I, um, I share your concern that the pendulum toward telemedicine could swing way too far. I, I think that this um, the very act of physical touch from a doctor who is touching you appropriately to do a physical exam, to test your tendons, to like look in your ear, like people probably don't think about it, but all those gentle touches are, you know, it's what we as babies, how we felt connected to our mothers is that they held us. And so um, I think stripping away all of that is really uh, dangerous. Um, as a psychiatrist, of course, we don't touch our patients. And so this is not that relevant to us. And um, I used to put in the, in the empathy acronym, a T was for tone of voice and touch, but I got so much pushback about, no, you can't touch. But of course, if you're an orthopedic surgeon, you're touching your patients just to do your diagnosis, to make sure you, you, you know, you're, you're examining and getting the right uh, evaluation. So um, I, I think the pendulum is going to swing very widely toward doing everything we can online for a while. Um, and I have a physical coming up uh, in August and uh, I was told I could do it through telemedicine. And I, I felt this tremendous disconnect, like how is she gonna know I'm okay when she can't listen to my, you know what I'm saying? So I think other people will have this, this reaction of like, that doesn't feel that thorough. I want a real exam. Um, and as the fear of, of you know, the contagion diminishes, I, I think we're gonna see more people wanting to, you know, get back to that doctor-patient intimacy, which involves touch. Yeah, Helen, uh, thank you very much for this very, very sort of wonderful lecture, very informative, and I think uh, which really concerns all of us, you know. Uh, my point was that uh, medical professionals, you know, and different medical professionals have different personalities. So some are introverts, some are extroverts, some are right aggressive, you know. So when we talk of empathetic concern, you know, and demonstration of that concern, I mean, how does the personality affect that empathetic concern or demonstration of it? That, that's my well, question to you. You're, you're right that we all have different personalities and um, for some people, these skills come much more easily. Um, than others. 
what, what I have noticed in, in doctors who will say, I'm not touchy feely. I don't do that. You know, I'm, I am more the detached kind of person, or, um, I don't really like to get into all that emotion. You know, um, when we do our training, we show them, we're not trying to dive into a, you know, like a swamp of emotion. We're trying to identify what is this person feeling right now today with me? And so we can teach curiosity. We can teach how to ask the right question. You know, what's your main concern today? Or how can I best take care of that problem? So that you don't have to change your personality to learn how to ask good questions. And that is how we dispel this myth that empathy is gonna add 10 minutes onto every visit. It, it's actually gonna help you be more efficient because you're gonna to know to ask what the patient you know, what their concerns on and what really matters to them. Yeah. I hope that helps because we can't do personality transplants. And I'll say one more thing about that. We had a, a doctor once who, who just said, you know, I just don't go there with the emotion. I just can't. It's just not me. It's, you know, I'm, I, you could say I'm on the spectrum. I just don't do that. And she learned to look people in the eye and just say, I imagine that's hard for you. And she said the first time she said it, somebody said, oh, thank you so much. That means so much to me that you care. And she actually started to feel something that she had never felt before, which was people loved connecting. And now she's, you know, somebody who talks about the importance of empathy. And it's such a great example of learning a few little changes of behavior can actually open up a way to relate that really feels good. So uh, Helen, is, is sort of empathy different in different situations? You know? Now, I, I was thinking, for example, um, you know, you have a war. You know? Now, how can you empathize with, with your opponent in that sort of a situation? You know? So it's situation governing the empathy. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand. You have a what? War, a battle, a war, a, a war? fight. Yeah. Okay. And how does empathy work there? Does it really work there? What happens to that empathy within you? Do you mean when you have a... Um, a war or a battle? Like a prejudice yeah. already that this person is like an enemy and not... No, not no, a real war friend? between nations, you know. A war between nations on, on oh. the war front. <laughs> You know, how does empathy work? You know, and another side to this question is what happens when you practice euthanasia? Not that I'm practicing it, but I was just keen to know, you know, is euthanasia a form of empathy? Um, I think it can be. It, it's a very big question. And I know that there's a lot of, you know, philosophical arguments one way or the other. Um, I don't know if this is the place to put my personal opinion, but I, I, at, I can understand there are situations where helping someone get out of their suffering, if that's really what they want, um, that we, we have to take those requests very seriously. Mm -hmm. As far as a war, I, I can offer you this insight. Um, when one of my mentors was doing uh, group meetings between two warring countries and he would have members of each of the warring countries in one group. One person would say, you slaughtered my father, you killed my sons, you did this, you put us in camps. And then the other side would say, you killed my grandmother, you killed my daughter, you, you burned down my house. And when they talked to each other, they realized they were all suffering from the same thing and that they were hurt as humans, not as this group or that group, but that what they were doing was robbing people of what was most precious in their lives. And those groups actually led to people befriending each other. Um, if, if something like this could be done on a leadership scale, um, I, I do think empathy, you know, at, at the heart of it is treating all people as humans and figuring out, you know, where greed and power are out of line to, you know, from the 
real quest of having all people have an opportunity for safety and happiness. So, yes. Sandeep, you have one question. So, yeah, can you? Yes. Yes, uh, Dr. Helen, Dr. Taral Nagda from Mumbai has a question for you. And uh, he wanted to know, does the rates of empathy and patient satisfaction vary from various branches of medicine? And within orthopedics, do subspecialities like spine surgery, joint replacement, pediatric orthopedics, do they have different rates of empathy? What's, what's your comment on that? My comment on that is that our observation is that the more a specialty is focused on one body part, like just the ear, just the throat, or just the elbow or the knee, the greater the risk to miss the whole person. And um, so, you know, internal medicine doctors are, you know, kind of well known for having more empathy, they're, they're having to work with the whole person. And so subspecialties where your focus can get very narrow can, um, can cause a, a, you know, a, a mindset that's like, I'm so happy with how that operation went because now that person can walk or run again, but, you know, maybe not take other factors into consideration. So I, I think that that question is, is a really good one as far as specialty services and the need to see people as whole people. Okay. So I have a question of my own, Helen. So uh, we've been talking about patient, uh, empathy towards patient and his suffering. Uh, what is your comment on empathy towards colleagues and their suffering? Toward colleagues and their suffering? Yes, because sometimes you will have patients coming for second opinions with a complication from a colleague who's been operating in different circumstances, different cultural backgrounds, maybe different religious beliefs, and you are called upon to make a judgment call, medical legally or with today's litigy in a society. So how does empathy work vis-a-vis -vis delivery of justice and empathy towards your colleague? Well, I think, you know, our integrity is the most important um, and the way we can assess a situation, um, it can be extremely harsh and demeaning of others, or it can be more objective. Um, you know, one, one of the worst things patients want to hear is one physician ganging up on another person's care. Now, of course, there are egregious things where there's, you know, no excuse, and I'm not talking about that. But medical care is complicated, and p complications are faced. There are different, you know, circumstances that lead to bad outcomes. My thought is, keeping your curiosity open to kind of what really happened. Is there another side to this story and not sort of ganging up on um, defaming a colleague, um, but trying to keep an understanding of, of what really happened. Um, I, I would love to hear Dr. Goldberg and, um, and, and Dr. Jahari chime in on that because I'm, curious what they would say. Well, uh, one of the uh, things um, that a, a question that comes, we have uh, uh, conferences uh, all the time that discuss complications. And the question is, how are we taught to discuss complications of our colleagues? And what do we do about it? Do we, as teachers, and looking at our own training, did we begin with a just culture? Or did we begin with name and blame and shame? Did we ask about the complication in a way, what did you do? 
And we never follow up with asking our colleagues, how did it feel to have a complication? When I ask colleagues after our mortality morbidity conference, what bothered them the most? For residents, it was being shamed and blamed. But for attending surgeons, it was having to face that patient on rounds every day in follow-up and seeing that complication. So what can I do empathetically to bridge that? Do this person want me to make rounds with him or her so they're not alone seeing those patients? We have to look at both what is done and what are the feelings that go with what you're doing. And I think if we start thinking differently in our training and in our practices about how we evaluate missteps and missing the marks, including uh, not the name, blame, shame, but the feeling of vulnerability that comes and the feeling of support would go a long way in making it easier for us to understand other people's complications in surgery. I'm sorry, it was such a long answer, but that was... Yeah, great comments, though. Yeah. Well, I, I would look at it uh, from uh, two points of view. You know, one is the objective evaluation of what went wrong, and uh, the second would be a subjective evaluation. When I say subjective, it would mean the background and whether you know, there was any sort of negligence, you know, I think uh, defining negligence is important. Uh, but uh, other than negligence, there could be expected complications, there could be expected side effects, which, uh, which have to be accepted, you know, they can be pardoned. So only gross negligence and lack of knowledge, ignorance. Well, it's, it's difficult to hide, you know, that uh, from a patient, you know, he, if you don't tell him, somebody else is going to tell him. But then, for all the other things, I, I really cover up, you know, for the other consultant or for the other specialist, you know, because that could happen to anyone and it could have happened to me even, you know. So if it could happen to me, I mean, it can happen to anyone. That's sort of pardonable, you know, but if it is a problem of negligence, that is not pardonable. I, I, that point is excellent. You know, I think what Michael brought up is the fact that no one taught us to err is human. Like we are going to make mistakes. We were raised at a time when it was like, you can't make a mistake. And so there was a lot of perfectionism and hiding of mistakes and shame about saying you didn't know or something went wrong. And it really drove so much curiosity and um, ability to kind of understand what are, how do we get in these complications? What can we learn instead of like burying mistakes? So creating a culture where to err as human is seen first and foremost is really important. And the, the point that Dr. Jahari brings up about if there's gross negligence or a lack of understanding about how to do a procedure, our empathy for a colleague cannot supersede you know, maybe bringing up the fact that somebody doesn't know how to do an operation or is doing procedures that they never got trained to do. And I mean, that's a, a gross negligence. And there we can still feel sympathy that somebody is going to have to suffer some consequences, but it's the health of the patient that has to come first. Right. I think Dhirenpa has a question. Diren, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Dr. Helen, uh, there is a new concept uh, which is coming in the field of empathy, and that is an experiential empathy. Means like you experience the problem of uh, the other person. Like recently, uh, like before two or three years, I attended one workshop in which 
uh, our group was made to remain in a complete darkness for three hours. And we were asked to carry out a lot of activities like uh, making a paper bridge, uh, making a coffee in the darkness. And that really made us aware about the problems which blind people are facing. So can we do the same thing in medicine like every doctors or every residents uh, when they join the training, they are supposed to be a patient, not the real patient, but uh, like they, they have to behave like a patient and they should feel how the other patients are feeling. What do you think about that idea? Well, there is no greater lesson in empathy than literally walking in the shoes of somebody else. And so there have been many nice smaller studies um, that actually put people in a wheelchair for a, a few days so that they can see what it's like to navigate in a wheelchair. Um, the, the, the hmm. Yeah, I think there is a problem in the uh, network. So uh, Michael, can you answer this question? What do you think about this experiential empathy well i see that uh that helen is back it was uh, yeah, quick i think helen's yeah. back yeah oh, okay. I, I had a little unstable internet i think i'll just okay. finish and would love to hear what michael says but these experiential um exercises are very powerful empathy builders um i i once wore a device that a, a company was building to help doctors understand what having Parkinson's is like. And this device was making my hand shake. I couldn't button my, my jacket. I couldn't write my name. And I only had it on for like less than five minutes, but I, that was that was such a, uh, a, 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 an eye opener um, to, to understand what a terrible disease that is. Michael, what were you gonna say? So I, I had a question, but it's a quick answer. As I, um, I am, um, uh, in a, what you're asking the experience, I have to tell everyone we're all have a, uh, a, a chronic disease. It's called getting older. <laughs> and it is as I recognize uh, that I do things slower. I miss a word here or there. Uh, my vision <laughs> is failing. Uh, it causes me to uh, face, if not mortality, vulnerability and our vulnerability. And I think that that's a very uh, important exercise for physicians to do. And the question which related to what Ashok was saying about personality, with whom am I comfortable talking about my own sense of vulnerability? Uh, is it with my colleagues, family? Where can I do this? Because as I do that, I find I get a greater sensitivity and more empathic concern about patients who have uh, what they just had their disability walking at an earlier age than I now, but we're going, we're going uh, through that. So that would just be my one thought. And I, I don't know how much time is remaining, but I did want to ask Helen one question about something she wrote about and which came up in here is that I find it easier to feel empathetic about some of my patients than for others. And uh, it, it, it was hard for me to realize that, that empathy is, is uh, easier. People my age who are suffering from the same thing I have, I have a lot of empathy for. And it's harder to have other patients. And then there are whole groups of patients which I'm fearful that I even assign stigma to, uh, those who substance abuse or other things. And so, Helen, if you have a minute or two to, how do we as physicians recognize within ourselves that there is an ease of feeling 
empathy for some and more difficulty feeling empathy for others and how do we still deliver the care they need and deserve? So Michael, you, you without realizing it, have outlined like the kind of basic human tendencies about empathy. And there are three types of people that we have the easiest time empathizing with. It's people who are most like ourselves, people who have suffered the way we have, and people who share a common goal. And I'm sorry to say, but that is how our brains are made. And so we are in a very challenging time in history where we have to override some of these like supernatural, uh, I don't mean like supernatural, I mean very natural tendencies to, like if you see a, a man your age who's having the same, it, it's just gonna flow out of you. What we really have to work on is recognizing our implicit biases, you know, through learning so much about addiction through some courses I've taken. I used to be more judgmental about people who, you know, misuse drugs. Now I, I really see that they're so unfortunate that their brains are made in a way that they'll get into trouble that I fortunately won't, but I have more empathy because I've learned more. Same with empathy for people who look different from us. So some of these things we have to recognize in ourselves, get to know more people who are unlike ourselves. And then I believe these barriers start to diminish because we start to see each other all as human. Thank you. Jiren Bhai, so I, will, I think I, there's a, yeah. sorry, uh, there's a question from Ashu. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't ask me actually on the chat, okay. you know, that I must have right. the last yes. question and then you wind up. Yes, sir. So, yes. Um, you know, I was just thinking, you know, are the empathy levels different between uh, different professions and vocations, you know, so physicians versus business people versus politicians uh, versus, let's say, people who are philanthropists. Uh, how do you rate that empathy? Uh, I think power versus empathy is another issue, you know, so. Power and empathy? Yeah, yeah, power versus empathy, you know, so. Yes, well. Politicians are very powerful, but are they empathetic enough, you know? Yeah, well, um, we know uh, from many studies that there's an inverse relationship between power and empathy, because if you know that certain people's problems will never touch you, it's easier not to care about those people. And so having an empathic leader is um, an incredible gift and a skill. Um, leaders devoid of empathy um, can be very scary because they don't really think about how maybe their, you know, their policies are gonna affect others. Um, as far as different professions, I think it's across the board, you know, there are certain professions that you probably wouldn't go into if you didn't care about people. I can't imagine wanting to be a nurse if you just don't care about people. But there's always a, you know, there's a spectrum of how, you know, how each person is built and made. And some people might be more drawn to technical type of nursing and other people more to hand holding. Um, so I, I think within each profession, there's, there's a range. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you very much. Now I request uh, uh, Dr. Sandeep to uh, take charge for the vote of thanks. And uh, if time permits, uh, summarizing the session. Over to you, Sandeep. Thank you, thank you, Diran Bhai. So at the outset, on behalf of uh, the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India, I would like to really thank Dr. Helen Rice uh, for taking out time to spend uh, her thoughts and educate us about empathy. And it was wonderful to know that it can be a learned skill. You can learn empathy and you can change. I guess that will be a big uh, change for most physicians if they could change their personality towards empathy and help their patients more. So thank you very much. And I'm sure uh, more people from India would be logging into your TED Talks as well as uh, your empathetics. So thanks again from Posey. Uh, 
again i would like to thank dr michael goldberg for sparing the valuable time and his wonderful insightful comments on the various questions that were raised and finally dr ashok johari for sparing his time and contributing to this very interesting topic of empathy i'm sure we can go on for quite a long longer time but uh, we are running short and we have to wind up by 10:15 uh, because there are so many more questions that remain unanswered and if possible then by we could arrange one more session only to discuss or some some kind of a, a clubhouse talk or a podcast by dr helen so in this uh, world with uh, corona still around i guess empathy is very much required and uh, we need to all stay safe and take care and take our vaccines on time so thank you very much and good thank night thank you for having me thank you so yeah. much yeah. thank you thank, thank you, you. thank you yeah.